trick about the, those chords is that if, if you make like the OK sign like this, notice how narrow your index finger is right there because the trick is you got these other two strings that are going to be on the either side and if you roll your finger from one way to the other you're going to dampen the adjacent string and the goal when you use the left hand is to make a fretted note sound as nice and round and clean as an open string. So if you make the OK sign you notice that the the finger is very narrow but if I roll it over just a little bit it's like twice as fat and that's and what I, so in other words when I go to note a, 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 a string I want to use the very tip of my finger so if I break that knuckle that knuckle is curved and there's like a really kind of narrow place I can use each of my fingers and I got big hands but uh, that way I'm off of the adjacent string and that's another reason why to put your thumb in the back because when my thumb rides high on the banjo it pulls the fingers over into the next string and it'll mute it where you get like kind of sound. Well, so what you want is you, when you make a C chord, for instance, you want each tone to be as, as nice and round as an open string. Like that. When I go to D7, the same thing. And I can pull the banjo out. Make sure I'm not horsing on the neck. And make sure I'm not pulling the strings off axis or whatever. I'm just pushing down enough strength to get a good clean tone out of each string. Out of each note. So now we can do this. Now let's put those two ideas together. The roll and the chords together. Um, a very common chord progression that you see in a lot of pieces is called the 12-bar blues. And um, each roll corresponds to one bar or one measure. So um, one roll pattern makes one bar. So let's do this. If you can imagine a, a grid, a little matrix that has three rows with four bars in each row. The first row has four bars of G four times through the roll pattern of G. The second row has two bars of C, two bars of G. The third row has one bar of D7, one bar of C, two bars of G. And with that, that's a 12-bar blues form. And there's so many tunes that are built on that form, a million like rock songs and country songs and you know all different kinds of pieces of, of, of American music are built on those changes. And you can probably, down, probably find the, the changes written down on the internet if you googled uh, 12 bar blues in G you can see what that looks like graphically but in your head if you could just think about that there, you'll play four patterns of G two patterns of C two patterns of G one D7 one C and two G's that makes 12 so here's what that would sound like and I'll do it again with the metronome and the idea is the right hand pays no attention to the left hand. All I'm doing is putting the left hand fingers down at the right spot and the right hand is ignoring me completely and just doing the roll 12 times. Um, so that, that's how that works. So this, that's what this would sound like and I'm going to play the uh, forward roll again. Here we go. Ready? Go. idea would be if you could learn to do that right there you're doing a whole lot of stuff you're learning a chord progression you're learning to change chords you're learning the three most common chords in the key of G you're learning to roll the banjo you're learning a whole bunch of stuff so just that goal right there is a really really good goal that might take 
it might take a person six months of like work to do that, but it's, it, it may take a year, it may take a week, whatever it takes, but um, it, it's going to take a substantial amount of effort over time to get that together, so don't be too dismayed about it, but it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to practice. A couple of points you'll notice is I'm not always striking every string that's in the chord. For instance, when I'm making the C, obviously with the roll I'm only playing 5-3-1, 5-3-1, 5-3, I'm only playing those three strings. So I'm fretting other strings other than 5, 3, and 1. But just keep working on it. Just keep playing them. Even though you don't strike the string, it's a good way of just remembering what's going on there. And uh, the other thing is to, to just to get really comfortable with making errors. Um, when I, I, I taught in a little guitar store for quite a while, and, and I remember sometimes students, when they would make a mistake, they would almost recoil as though they were shocked. And, and they felt really bad about like hitting the wrong note or something, making a you know, playing a measure too long or whatever, forgetting something. And we just get really comfortable with that because that's learning to play an instrument. And you just get where you just accept that into the equation and it's okay and you, and you don't worry about that stuff. Because I've been practicing for 38 years. I still take lessons and study. And when I'm practicing, you can't even stay in the room with me because I'm learning, I'm playing stuff that I don't know how to do. And so when I do that, it sounds a little, uh, it's a little hard to listen to, but uh, I, I'm comfortable with it and I'm used to it and I, I keep working. And then when I play, I play what I know how to play. And so that's a different f activity than practicing. When I practice, I work on stuff that I can't play. And so, and like I say, I've been at it a long time. Uh, come, not very long, I'll be at it 40 years. And that's basically all I do and uh, is practice the banjo and work on that and stuff and, and work on music and things and, and I still have to you know remind myself that it's okay to make mistakes it's okay just keep moving ahead and keep working and over time you learn it over time but if I get too freaked out uh, over little mistakes I'm, I'm not ever going to get there so um, that's one thing I learned from watching a lot of students learn to play is is that the ones that seem like that they didn't really freak out when they hit an error seemed like they were able to maintain interest in the banjo over time. Another thing is uh, the banjo, if you, if, if you have a banjo and it's in the case and you pull it out and practice and put it back in the case and you have this sort of dualism, this dualist relationship with the banjo, every time you hold it you feel like you got to do something you're kind of judging yourself but a, a really cool way of like kind of getting used to the banjo is just to sit around and hold it like just to get used to it being in your lap maybe if you're on the phone you can hold a banjo if you're watching tv or if you're doing something on the computer just hold the banjo and get used to it being in your lap because it has a certain feel to it and everything and and you sort of get comfortable with it like a pair of jeans that you've had for a long time or whatever you get used to it and uh, it's, 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 it, it helps you just to sit around and hold it even if you don't do anything Another little trick about just getting some music out of the banjo is if you just mute the strings like this and play a record that you like, you can just play drums along like this part with the banjo. Like if you, you can just not really worry about it, uh, any music or anything, I'm just sort of muting the strings like this and I'm just playing the, the right hand just playing like I'm playing the drums. It's almost like I'm shaking water off my hands or something. But if I'm listening to a record or something, you know, but... I don't have to worry about melodic content or rhythmic content, but it's just a way of kind of getting comfortable with the banjo and listening to music and sort of relating to this external source of a rhythm or melodic thing or whatever.